Hello everyone, my name is Nick, and today we're going to talk about plants I've killed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's kind of this assumption that people like me and other houseplant YouTubers and plant influencers, that we just don't kill plants, and that is anything but the truth. I kill plants, I'm sure all of the other influencers kill plants as well, and I'm sure you kill plants, and if you don't kill plants, you are doing something right, I'm going to say that first, but two, I'm going to say buckle up, because the journey of growing plants is... A wild one, for lack of better term. I have this kind of policy uh, for myself, three strikes and you're out with houseplants. A lot of the ones I'm going to talk about today are ones that I've either killed two or three times, and if I kill them three times, I do not bring them in my home again because that is a waste of money and a headache that I am not willing to go for again. So that being said, we're just going to talk about some plants that I have killed on multiple occasions. The one good thing I will say about killing plants on multiple occasions would be that you kind of learn what you do wrong. So if you are going to go ahead and attempt the plant again for some reason, you will kind of know what to expect and what precautions to take and what extra steps to take and all that jazz. Uh, that being said, I'm not really willing to grow many of the plants I'm going to talk about today because I've just not had very good luck with them. I think maybe one or two of the ones on this list I am still actively growing in my home, uh, but not many of them because, like I said, they are just a headache that I am not willing to go through again. So the first plant I'm going to talk about today is a prayer plant. Shocker, I'm going to talk about a few prayer plants today. It's Calathea White Fusion. Now, if you've walked into a plant store, pardon my cat's kind of rubbing up against me here. Uh, if you walked into a plant store and stumbled across Calathea White Fusion, you've probably been like, oh my gosh, this plant is beautiful. I have to have it. It is a stunning plant. I'll definitely include a photo that I have on my Instagram so you guys can see if you're not familiar. It is one of the most beautiful plants out there, specifically on the market that's readily available in houseplant stores. It comes with a price, or a headache, I should say, because the price isn't really that astronomical, but it comes with the headache that the plant brings. Once you bring it home, this plant just, I've, I've never had good luck with it. I've never really heard of anybody who grows this plant successfully over a long period of time. You could perhaps successfully grow it for maybe a month or two, but give it more than the season, and I have never seen success with this plant. It is so difficult. I'm also really wary to just carry it in the store where I work because I know people are kind of, sorry if you guys can hear my cat playing with his toys, oh my gosh, but I'm just kind of wary on sending plants home with people that I don't feel comfortable that they're going to be able to care for correctly. I don't want people to spend, Oh my gosh, this is not going to work out. One moment. Okay, sorry. But yeah, I just don't want people to spend 10 to $20 on a house plant that I just know from experience they're going to bring home and kill. I'm sure some of you out there grow this plant successfully. I would love to know how because I really have no idea how to care for this plant. Uh, as, it having, as, as it has white foliage, it definitely appreciates more light than we give most of our other Calatheas. Uh, it definitely appreciates more humidity as well as it being very fickle, but I think it's just so funny because it's a it's a cultivated variety of plant, and many times cultivated varieties or hybrids are they are <laughs> hybridized to be good to grow, and this one is just a nightmare. So most hybrids, I am like A plus, you did a great job, but the Calathea white fusion <laughs> that is not the case, unfortunately. And then we're gonna talk about another Calathea next. Um, this one is Calathea medallion, which I think is also a type of Calathea roseopicta, which is the Latin name. The medallion is more of a, a cultivar, if I'm not mistaken, or it's one of the roseopictas. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this could be said for all Calathea roseopicta. Any of the cultivars, there's like the rosy. Oh, there's so many more. Odati, I'm blanking on a few of the other names, but you guys know what I'm talking about. The large, round-leafed Calatheas. I have never had good luck with them. I have tried every single one in my home that I've stumbled across because they are so pretty, just like the Calathea White Fusion. You walk into a plant store, you see these beautiful prayer plants, and you're like, I just have to try it. More so in my earlier stages, my first few years of houseplants, I was just so drawn to prayer plants because they are just so beautiful. But the more I got acclimated with growing them, the more I've learned that I appreciate them from afar. <laughs> and maybe some of you will learn to do the same, but there there are some exceptions. I did a video in the past on easy prayer plants to grow. There are definitely a few that I would say are very reliable growers, uh, but Calathea White Fusion and Calathea Medallion or any of the Calathea Rosia Picta varieties, I have just never had good luck with myself, and it's a shame because they are just such beautiful varieties of plants. 
but all of these problems I'm thinking are stemming from the type of water. Calatheas overall are very sensitive to the type of water, and back in my earlier stages of gardening, I was very diligent about using distilled water on all of my prayer plants, but nowadays I don't really care as much. Uh, I'm okay with a little bit of browning here and there, but uh, these plants just go from A to Z, like alive to dead in just a very short amount of time. Along with the type of water, it's really important to supplement some extra humidity with your calatheas or else I find they get some brown edges and can deteriorate rather quickly without it. One more prayer plant we're gonna talk about before I can move on to another topic since I've been talking about prayer plants forever is Stromanthe sanguinea triostar, which is the red, green, and white prayer plant. It's got some really beautiful foliage. It's one that I just fell in love with years ago when I first got into house plants and I had to have it and I brought it home and I've killed it so many times. It's such a beautiful plant. I really wish I could grow this plant in my home. I grow the non-variegated version, the plain Stromanthe sanguinea, and it's my first attempt and it's been so far so good. It's not like growing like a weed by any means, but it's it's been a easy growing prayer plant. But the, the Triostar, while I've seen many other people and some of my coworkers actually grow it very successfully, I cannot grow this prayer plant. So once again, it probably needs a little bit more light than I'm giving it with the, the white foliage. And perhaps it could really use that extra humidity. It definitely could use the extra humidity as far as some prayer plants go. So type of water and uh, humidity definitely come into play with the Stromanthe sanguinea once again. Another plant I have killed on many occasions is Hedera helix, which is your standard English ivy. I've definitely talked about this a lot on YouTube, how much I love but hate ivy. I love the way it looks. It's such a vibe. I live in the northeast of the United States, so it's just really lovely to see ivy as a houseplant because it's just kind of what you see growing invasively, of course, but here in the, the Northeast. So I really like to have a piece of, you know, outside in the home, but unfortunately, Hedera helix or English ivy really is just a headache, as you're gonna hear me say about a lot of these plants in this video. Hedera, or Hedera's in general for inside really need a lot of light that I am unable to supplement, even with my southern facing windows. But the main problem I have with English ivy is the pests. They are a spider mite magnet. Even mealybugs and uh, other types of scale, I wouldn't even be surprised to see like thrips or aphids on these. I feel like they're just, every pest in the book loves English ivy. Even when I, on the, the few occasions I've ordered it at the store where I work, which I never order English ivy again, but when I first got started and they kind of wouldn't let me curate the selection as much as I would have liked. Uh, every time the English ivy would come in covered in spider mites, literally every single time, it was a, a very good way to, to convince uh, my superiors to let me stop selling English ivy at the store. So it doesn't work for me. If it's working for you, I would love to hear what you're doing because I would love to get this plant to work, but the, the pests and the, the light needs are just something I cannot give this plant. Moving on, let's see here, Dracaena marginata. I love Dracaenas. I actually grow a few more like basic, I would say, Dracaenas in my home. Like Dracaena Janet Craig is one that I really appreciate. And I have Dracaena Janet Craig Compacta, which is just a more compact version of Dracaena Janet Craig, as the name suggests. Dracaena marginata is a very, very common Dracaena. It's one of the most common ones. It is the um, the red edge Dracaena, I think they call it dragon tree commonly. I think they call all Dracaenas dragon trees commonly, but if you walk into an Ikea, you will definitely see this plant sold for like a dollar ninety nine maximum in like a little tree form. Everyone mistakes it for a palm tree when they come into my work. Uh, for good reason, it looks, you know, it's got very thin palm frondish like leaves. Uh, but this plant is supposed to be very, really easy. I've seen some beautiful uh, Dr. Seuss like specimens uh, in my time, but they're, they've never been in my home. I think my issue with this plant is that I'm either overwatering it or underwatering it, or I'm not giving it enough light. I've killed two of them in the past, and I honestly haven't had them in my care for over a year now at this point so i can't really tell you exactly you know what i did wrong uh, but my assumption would be is not enough light i will admit that if a plant is readily sold you know like a, a big box store plant that i bought for three dollars and 99 cents you know back when i first got started with house plant i'll put it a little bit further back than I probably should. So some of the plants I'm talking about today admittedly could be just dying because of lack of care or just overall neglect is another word for it, I guess. But um, yeah, Dracaena marginata is one I've never really had good luck with. Speaking of which, Dracaena fragrans, which is your standard corn plant, I've never had good luck with as well. I get a lot of browning on these leaves. 
uh, Dracaena is very similar to Calafias are uh, very sensitive to fluoride in the water or other additives in the tap water like bromine, uh, chlorine as well. Uh, and that causes browning on the leaves, typically on the tip. But on my Dracaenas, I've had issues with the, the, the Dracaena fragrance specifically. I've had issues with browning on the edges. I just have, honestly have no idea what's going on. Uh, so it's just a plant. It's admittedly a little too common for my interest. I hate to say it, but it is. And uh, at this point, I'm just moving on from Dracaena fragrance. There's some really beautiful specimens, but um, I think it might be a little bit more apt to like an office setting underneath some fluorescent lights as like a big, beautiful, large plant rather than in my home. Moving on, I have some peperomias that I've actually really struggled with in my time. The first one is a really common one. It's peperomia obtusifolia. I actually no longer have any peperomia obtusifolias in my home because I have killed so many of them. This one has gone well past the, the three strike mark um, if we're being legitimate. Uh, there's many different cultivars of peperomia obtusifolia, so I've tried out many of these cultivars, uh, most of them not more than once because uh, they get one go and if it doesn't go well, they usually make their way out the door. So there are some really beautiful types of peperomia obtusifolia. I admittedly crush over it a lot when I see it at like a botanical garden or at say the Philadelphia flower show when I see them as like big, huge, robust specimens and their big zigzaggy red stems just stand out amongst the rest. They're a little underwhelming when you see them in the nursery in just little four inch pots, I will admit, but when they are large plants, they are just something I absolutely lust after, and I would love to have that in my home, but with my experience with Peperomia obtusifolia so far, that is not happening. One more uh, Peperomia, or actually I have a few more Peperomia. Uh, this is one that I actually still do grow in my home. This is Peperomia caparata, or the ripple Peperomia. I have killed so many of these as well, definitely on par with the Peperomia obtusifolia. I have one, it's a raspberry ripple that I successfully grow. I am putting this one in a really small container. It's actually growing in a French terracotta yogurt cup. Uh, and it seems to really enjoy being in a small space. It was actually a plant left over. I was building a bunch of terrariums at work and I had just one little piece of pepperoni left over and they let me take it home. So potted up in the little yogurt uh, container and it has taken off ever since. It looks beautiful. Every other Peperomia caparata I brought into my life has not grown as swimmingly. Uh, a lot of Peperomias uh, with the thicker stems, like the obtusifolia, I think what I'm doing wrong with that, and, and the caparata, which has a very thick pilea peperomioides like base, Peperomia argyria, watermelon Peperomia, Peperomia verschafeltii, there's a bunch of them. I think these all grow much better if you leave them in their plastic nursery pot. Uh, my Verschafeltiis and my Argyrias I leave in the plastic pots and I have had very good luck with them. My Obtusifolias and Caparatas, perhaps since they're a little bit more common, I'm a little bit more uh, careless with them and will put them into a container that I just see fit and sometimes they just rot. So I think, one, it's perhaps me not giving them enough light. Peperomias usually don't require too much light, like they don't need, require a bright windowsill, but from my experience with my, my Peperomia caparata that's doing rather well right now, I would say maybe that is the case. Maybe they do need a little bit more light than I am giving them. One more Peperomia that I am struggling with, um, I don't think I actually have any more of them in my home at the moment, is Peperomia rugosa. It's a really beautiful Peperomia with some dark olive green foliage and red undersides. If you follow me on, on YouTube or Instagram, you probably know that I love plants that have different color foliage on the underside than the top side. I think it's just such an incredible trait. So for that reason, I really uh, lust after Peperomia rugosa or having at least a beautiful specimen in my home, which is something that I have not been able to achieve. I think this once again falls into that same category as the Peperomia caparata and the obtusifolia where once I repot them, I really don't have very good luck with them. They tend to just rot out easily. I really should just try these all again with leaving them in their plastic nursery pots and perhaps giving them a little bit more light than I'm giving them. Uh, these Peperomia, specifically the Ripple and the Obtusifolia, don't really require extra humidity. Uh, the Rugosa is a little bit less cultivated, maybe that one in particular would appreciate a little bit more of a humid environment. Uh, but those other two, I've seen people grow them perfectly fine in an office, so I'm thinking I should probably take a tip from them and really just give them a little bit more neglect per se. And the last plant we're going to talk about today is Peace Lilies. I have grown so many peace lilies. I love peace lilies. I fell in love with them. One of the first plants I bought was a peace lily because it reminded me of the childhood trips I would take to Florida. For some reason, there are so many plants in Florida, but the peace lilies were the ones in particular that stood out to me. And 
they are just tough to grow. They, from the research I've done, and also you guys let me know on here a lot in the comments, that they are pumped with gibberellic acid when they come in like looking full, blooming, lush. Uh, it's the, the acid is to induce them to bloom. So when they kind of wear off of that acid, they get really wimpy and their leaves get really small and really don't even look like leaves anymore. And the flowers that they put off, if they even put off any flowers, are just really wimpy. So I kind of stray from those peace lilies in general. There are a few varieties I try. I have really good uh, luck with the domino peace lily, but every other peace lily I have tried under my care really just does not grow well for me. So peace lily is the last one I have to talk about. They have some really good uh, language letting you know when they need to be watered when they wilt. Uh, but for some reason, those peace lilies, I would be growing them and they would wilt. And then one day they would be wilted and they would just never come back up from that wilt. So uh, yeah, not as easy as the internet says they are. The domino, I've had some better luck with. Uh, perhaps it's definitely a cultivated variety of um, peacefully perhaps that's why it's a little bit tougher but I think it's actually because it's not grown for its flowers it's grown for its foliage the, the domino uh, so it's not pumped with the gibberellic acid if I'm not mistaken so that one I think is a little bit more easy going for that reason I could be wrong if you do have any insight on that I would love to hear because I am not a hundred percent certain uh, otherwise I think that's gonna do it for today's video I'm gonna cap it off at 10 today I can keep on going I've killed plenty more plants but um, if you guys are interested in this I can definitely do another video in the future but I have definitely been talking for a long time about plants I've killed and I would like to move on uh, to some life and happiness if you will so thank you guys so much for joining me um, I would love to hear what plants you guys kill on the regular in the comments below uh, if you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Philly Foliage, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you guys in my next video. Have a great time!